Till the end of time Long as stars are in the blue Long as there's a spring of bird to sing I'll go on loving you Till the end of time Long as roses bloom in May My love for you With every passing day Till the wells run dry And each mountain disappears I'll be there for you to care for you Through laughter and through tears So take my Tenderly say that I'm the one you love and live for till the end of time. Welcome to Bay Area Psychology. This is that wedding time of year. Not a weekend goes by where I don't see a decorated car or a bridal party scattered on the steps of a church. In that magic moment of time, reality is suspended and the till death do us part commitment seems possible. Sadly, we are facing a 50% divorce rate in California with wedding parties often consisting of at least one child from a previous marriage. Why do our relationships seem to hold such promise at the beginning, only to deteriorate within a few years as we argue over money, children, and sex? Too often I hear clients saying, if only I had known. Tonight we will look at the benefits of premarital counseling, steps we can take to strengthen our ability to stay together in good times and bad, in sickness and health, whether rich or poor. To help us shore up our odds is Len DiPaolo, an MFCC with HQI, and Barbara Ellenberger, MFCC with Connections Counseling Associates. I want to thank you both for being with us tonight. Thank you. Well, you had a chance to see our uh, beginning ending, uh, the beginning of our clip, which was uh, had a storybook feel. In fact, much of it had been taped in Disneyland itself. And I imagine that your professional experience is probably different than that, that in fact, um, you, based on what you do for a living, probably don't see a lot of happy ending couples. Is that about right? I would say that. Yeah. I would say that. Yeah. So, um, unfortunately, it's probably true that couples wait until the end part to see you. And I, my understanding is that as people are becoming more and more sophisticated about relationships, reading more self-help books, that they're beginning to seek out some counseling prior to making that big step which must be encouraging for you. Um, I imagine that that allows you to be able to, to participate in um, more successes. Yeah, what I've seen a lot is that perhaps I'll be seeing someone for a while and they won't be in a relationship. By the time they get in a relationship, they will have a chance to have a more realistic view of what might be coming down the pike. And it's nice to have the initial romanticism that we saw. And but after that, there's more of a realism that, that sinks in that's no less valuable. It doesn't feel as valuable at times, but it takes a lot more of an effort at times and a lot more of a, of a commitment. And usually people haven't experienced those feelings up until that point when they get to certain points of a relationship. So I will do some premarital counseling now based on individuals who have possibly been in their own therapy before or individuals who do seek some information uh, more than just doing it because whoever they're, whatever church or whatever they're getting married at requires them to do it. People who are interested in learning better ways or ways that might work, a more realistic way uh -huh. to be in a relationship, then down the road I think the chances of problems would be less. Well, I think part of that premarital counseling is preparing people for the reality of this commitment 
that this is not just a, you know, um, we're going to live happily ever after and it won't be work. I mean, I think the reality is that it actually is work. Has that been your experience? It's a lot of work. And I've been very gratified to hear people get on the phone and call me up and say, you know, we're getting married at this and this time, but there are a few things that we just don't agree on and I'd like to iron them out. And my boyfriend's really willing to come or my girlfriend's really willing to come. And so these people not only have a good potential because they're actually going to do some work ahead of time, but it also means that they're not therapy phobic. It means that if there is anything that comes up after the marriage, and there very well may be, that they've already been to counseling, they know what it's like, they're not frightened, uh -huh. and they're willing to come again. That's a very good point. You know, a lot of people tend to be afraid of marital counseling because their picture of it is that if I come to counseling, you're going to tell me that I need to divorce my spouse. I mean, yeah. that, that, that's a bad thing to go and see a counselor. That's right. That means it's the beginning of the end. Right, right. So what we're talking about with premarital counseling is doing some prevention, maybe getting some cards out on the table. And that doesn't have to be a scary or frightening that's event. right. Okay. Yeah. We have a graphic prepared with some uh, tips that I picked up in my research <laughs> on things that might help make a successful relationship. And I thought maybe, you know, you could go through them with me and comment on your clinical and personal experience on each of them. Sure. Let's take a look at the first. Let's see. Beliefs and attitudes to make a marriage work. Realistic expectations that every marriage has good times mm -hmm. and bad times as well as the willingness to examine your role in every positive and negative exchange in your relationship. Let's take the first one. Uh, I know in the traditional ceremony it says, you know, good times and bad, so uh, is that something that you do have to spend some time with people preparing them for? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think one of the marks of a really good marriage is how well you handle conflict. It's not only how you get along well when times are good, because that's easy, but when things are hard, what do you do about getting over those hard times and how do you manage? So, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think the problem is if any type of conflict is seen as an enemy or a major problem or some type of insurmountable uh, block to the relationship that people are afraid to look at what some of the truth would be if they haven't looked at that before, uh -huh. if it's not that pleasant. And pleasant or not pleasant, the truth's going to come. And it's going to come calling, and you either meet it or you don't meet it, it's individually and in a relationship. So I think that the sooner the better. The more open you are to all aspects of what you're feeling about a relationship, the better. In the earlier phase of a relationship, sometimes it's more emotionally uplifting. Yeah. and some, depending on how long people take before they get married and how much they live in a day-to-day -day life with each other, they can, they can or cannot enter into some, a fair amount of conflict. And so the conflict isn't exactly the enemy. The, no. uh, the ignorance of the conflict and the ignorance of all parts of how you feel about a relationship is the enemy. Well, and, and in my experience too, clinically, is that, you know, frequently couples have uh, different concepts of conflict. I mean, I, you know, he may feel conflict as if we disagree at all, mm -hmm. and she may feel conflict as when we throw things. Anything short of that's a discussion. <laughs> and so then you have some definition that needs to happen because he'll be so afraid of throwing things, or she'll be so, af you know, that that is somebody who's not going to want to participate. And also, I was uh, thinking that conflict for a lot of people, as soon as there feels like there's an unpleasant feeling that there's something bad going on right. and that the marriage is bad, and actually it can be reframed to look at, to look as if, well, conflict is an opportunity, you know, it's an right. opportunity to learn something and to grow in the marriage and to make something brand new uh -huh. that didn't exist before. So it's a nice reframe, and it's true, too. And it doesn't necessarily mean, oh no, we have a conflict, it's over. You know, right. it's that panic. Right. So therefore, if I want the relationship to continue, I need to not acknowledge that this is happening. You know, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, it yeah, doesn't that's, matter. That's what will come and bite you in the behind, yeah. you know, when you're not looking, if you keep on ignoring it. Our second point that we had mentioned there was the willingness to look at whatever's going on from the other person's perspective. How do you assist people to do that? Usually, uh, if they are coming into therapy and they're at that point, something is kicking them in the butt, some okay. form of uh, pain. And 
So there is some motivation. And if, if they're blaming the other person, then you would work towards trying to get a more realistic, honest view of exactly what's going on on both sides. Because trying to find out the truth is, is the key to the whole thing. So sometimes their pain will motivate them to be more honest than they previously had been, especially after you start to get into the experience of therapy uh -huh. or the experience of opening your mind, reading something, uh, taking a different path than before. Sometimes you'll, you'll be more open to the whole repressed side of mm -hmm. what you haven't seen before. In other words, have you been an idiot? Yeah. And that's the key, is when you start to see what you're doing. Yeah, what's my part of this? How, well, how you, you know, respond. Yeah, and my part of it is the part I can change and control. Right. I mean, that's, I think that's one of the hardest parts sometimes to communicate to people is, no, you know, we're such a blame-oriented culture. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got to be somebody's fault, right. darn it, you know, and it shouldn't be mine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the positive things about it being ours is that then we can then do something about it. If I have to use my energy to make you do something, which right. is, I don't know about you, but that's in large part why couples come into counseling is yeah. she'll say, okay, I'd like you to fix the following things about him, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. and then everything will be fine. And I, I really have a, a, a desire not to use the word blame too much in therapy and counseling. Um, I like to think in terms of that people have different worldviews huh. and that um, from each person's perspective, what that person is saying is perfectly valid and there's nothing wrong with what that person is saying. And they may be saying completely diametrical things, um, the couple. So that it's in order to be, to be able to build a bridge from one person to another person, what you do is you get to understand what's happening on the other side of the bridge. Um, what is that person's worldview? What does it look like to be that person? How is it to be inside that, you know, that person's skin? And vice versa. Right. And in that way, you can build a bridge. We're going to need to take a uh, brief break, and then we'll return. And uh, when we return, we will receive more valuable tips to get our marriages off to a good start. Stay with us.